Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Grace Lutheran Podcast. This is Pastor Matt Nupel. Thank you for tuning into our program today as I share some thoughts on the current Asbury Revival in Kentucky. And of course, if you're living in the Winston-Salem or Pofftown area and you're looking for a church that offers traditional Christ-centered worship and is able to offer weekly Holy Communion, you are always invited to join us every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. at 3410 Community Church Road in Pofftown. So I'm currently recording this episode on Shrove Tuesday. This is the day before Ash Wednesday. And I was originally going to record an episode today about the importance and the significance of confession, more specifically private confession, uh, within the Lutheran tradition. But lately I've been getting a lot of emails and a lot of questions about this revival that's been going on in Kentucky at Asbury University. To be honest, I've seen headlines about the revival here and there for about a week, but I haven't done a lot of reading about it until just recently, so I feel like I'm still playing catch up on what the latest is. But as far as I can tell, on February 8th at Asbury University, there was a routine morning chapel service that, for whatever reason, didn't stop, but just kept going and going with worship music and occasional preaching and testimonies. And once this started picking up attention in the news, people from all over have started uh, flooding to Asbury University to be a part of this. Now, as of today, I'm getting conflicting reports on whether the revival at Asbury is still going on or not. Uh, some sources say it's slowed down. Um, I'm hearing other sources that are saying that it's still going on with no signs of stopping. Uh, but it turns out this revival has sparked other many revivals across the country. So even if this revival at Asbury is slowing down, uh, it seems like it has started this chain reaction of other revivals that are popping up at different universities. So today, instead of talking about private confession, I wanted to give just a few of my initial thoughts about this revival and how I believe we as the church are meant to treat revivals like this. In Sunday School, we recently watched a video series about Lutheran theology in comparison specifically to more evangelical or non-denominational theology. Throughout the class at different times, we sort of joked about how Lutherans have never really been the type to be street preachers or door-to-door -door evangelists. Not that preaching and evangelism aren't important, but Lutherans have historically maintained that those things are most effectual through the word and sacrament ministry of the church. That's going to be important later, but I think it's fair to say that traditional Lutherans, by and large, have not been the types to hold revivals as we understand them today. You could argue that the Missouri Synod movement, led by men like Walther and Pieper, uh, that was kind of a type of revival, sure. Uh, but you don't find many Lutherans holding tent revivals for a reason. But before we get into that reason and some others, I think it's important to point out how easy it is for Christians to look at this revival from the outside looking in and point fingers and criticize what's going on. Uh, not just Lutherans, but I've seen other types of Christians like Calvinists and Roman Catholics and Anglicans uh, going online to just list all the things the revival is doing wrong and why all Christians should avoid supporting it entirely. One of the most harmful parts of our sinful nature, I believe, is our disordered love of criticizing other people. It makes us feel good to point out flaws for all the wrong reasons. It makes us feel smarter or more righteous. And I want to do my best to avoid that by recognizing first and foremost how great it is to see so many young people expressing their desire to be close to Christ. How great it is that we're having a national discussion, a national news story being covered by CNN and Fox News that focuses on nothing but the praise and worship of God. No matter what your feelings are about the theology or the worship practices of what's going on in this revival, I believe that at the very least we can recognize that, that is something positive. It's opening up people on a massive scale to talk about God and evaluate their own spiritual condition, and it's obviously had a huge impact on at least tens of thousands of people. So by no means am I sitting here in judgment over the revival, or in a way that's questioning the Holy Spirit's activity at Asbury. I want to be clear that that's not my intention because I see a lot of positives coming out of this revival. But let's talk about why revivals as we know them today haven't been practiced historically by Lutherans. Not to get too technical, but I think this really goes all the way back to the Reformation itself. The historical myth about the Reformation that gets passed along quite a bit is that all the Protestants got along during and after Martin Luther. But that couldn't be further from the truth. 
Uh, instead, Luther's work sparked many different Protestant reformations throughout Europe, and a lot of them disagreed on how to understand Scripture alone, sola scriptura. So when these different Protestant groups were faced with the question, where does a Christian find assurance of salvation? Or how does a Christian find reassurance that they're really saved? There were, of course, different answers. For Lutherans, the answer is simple. A Christian can find assurance of salvation in the sacraments. When we are baptized, we are sealed with a promise from God that we are indeed his children, united to the death and resurrection of his son. When we hear the words of absolution on Sunday mornings from a pastor, we hear the forgiveness of Jesus Christ himself, And when we take the Lord's Supper, the life of Jesus is literally ingested, showing us that Christ is dwelling within our bodies. But for another Protestant Reformation group, a group often called the Radical Reformers, their answer was different. They said, well, because the sacraments are just symbols and ceremonies, Christians can't find any assurance of salvation there. Instead, a Christian can find assurance of salvation in their hearts. Are you in a right relationship with God? Do you have a deep love for Jesus? Are you desiring to obey God and the Ten Commandments? Those kinds of questions were the standard of salvation for a lot of the radical reformers. So you have this separation between traditions based on these two different answers. Lutherans on one side are pointing people to the sacraments of the church, while the radical reformer group points people to themselves. So as history progresses, guess which group gained the most historical and cultural influence in America? Definitely not the Lutherans, but it was the Radical Reformers. Because today, the descendants of the Radical Reformation are groups like Southern Baptists, Evangelicals, Pentecostals, uh, groups who generally agree on this point, that we find assurance in our hearts and not in the sacraments. So what does all of this have to do with revival? Well, simply put, I believe revivals like Asbury come from a deep spiritual yearning in our culture of what the sacraments have always offered the church. But because the Radical Reformation ditched the sacraments, at least when it comes to the question of assurance, most Christians in the U.S. don't see their value and therefore fill that void with their hearts. So to me, it seems as though this concept of revival comes from a desire to find assurance of salvation in our hearts or in our feelings towards God, whereas Lutherans all along have been teaching that we're meant to find assurance in the sacraments, where God has placed his word of forgiveness to us. And before anyone says, well, what about Martin Luther teaching faith alone? Martin Luther adamantly held the Lutheran position on this for his entire life. So I hope I didn't bore anyone with all that history, but I think it's important to see these current Christian events from a historical view, or how we got to where we are now. But does this mean all revivals are wrong, and that Lutherans should have nothing to do with them whatsoever? Well, no, I definitely don't think so. To be sure, I don't see myself ever hosting a tent revival anytime soon, and I personally don't see a biblical prescription for hosting something called a revival just for the sake of revival. But as I said before, we believe God works through his word. And because of the Asbury revival, that word is being spread in a unique way across the entire country. So there's no doubt God is using this revival as a way to deliver his gospel message to those who are spiritually lost. And we may not see the fruit of what that's doing in our lifetime. With all that being said... I do have a few concerns as a pastor about the overall intent and atmosphere of many revivals that we see today. First, in light of what we just mentioned earlier about historical Lutheranism, revivals seem to be driven by this idea that we need to seek the presence of God outside of Scripture and apart from the sacraments. That these means God has established to unmistakably hear his voice or receive his grace are not enough. But we need fill in the blank, an emotional mountaintop experience, a decision for Jesus, a miraculous vision. And again, I don't say this to minimize the Holy Spirit's activity in Asbury. But the same presence of God that people are being overwhelmed by in this revival comes to us every Sunday from our pulpit and from our altar. Is that as flashy or as exciting as a rock concert? Well, no. 
But we believe when we hear scripture being read, God is there. When we break bread and share the cup of the new covenant, God is there doing what he promises. So I'm a little cautious of any ideas about revival that suggest we need to look for God outside of the word and sacraments. Of course, God is everywhere, and I believe he is absolutely present in a unique way in Asbury. But we have to remember the Bible never tells us to find him in a revival or in an emotional experience. But the Bible does repeatedly direct us to the word and sacraments to find God's grace and his presence in our lives. Secondly, revivals are largely driven by emotion. And to be clear, I'm not saying this is necessarily a bad thing by itself. Emotions are what drive us as human beings to action, and any kind of cultural change will naturally begin with strong emotions. But the problem is emotions come and go. I've made this point in the past, but it's a major problem how a lot of Christians today equate positive emotions or feeling really good in worship as evidence of the Holy Spirit's activity. The truth is we can feel great while we're doing something sinful, and we can feel pretty crummy while the Holy Spirit is right there working something good in us. But when you hear a lot of these conversations from people at Asbury, the presence of the Holy Spirit is repeatedly confirmed by their emotions. You know, I could really feel the Holy Spirit moving in Asbury, or being in Asbury must be what heaven feels like. Again, I'm not trying to downplay the importance of human emotions when it comes to God. God absolutely be praised that people in Asbury have found this overwhelming joy in him and are able to express it in a way that's spreading across the country. But the question needs to be asked, what happens after the revival and everyone goes back to their normal lives? Hopefully they're going back with a renewed Christian focus after this revival, but if the Holy Spirit is all about these good feelings and our spiritual high, then what happens when stress comes back, when tragedy hits? What happens when depression hits and you can't feel anything? This is why vocation is an important, but I believe underappreciated area in the church. Vocation is the belief that your station in life whether it be your job, your role as a caregiver, your volunteer work, whatever it may be, that station is where God has intentionally placed you for that time being to serve him. Not just in a metaphorical sense, but Matthew 25 tells us that we find the presence of Jesus in every human being that we serve. Christian teachers encounter Christ and serve him in every student that they teach. Christian doctors encounter Christ and serve him in every patient that comes into their office. The point is God comes to us in our daily normal lives, not just in overwhelming spiritual experiences. No matter how long this revival lasts or how long this spiritual mountaintop experience lasts, there will always be a normal, ordinary life we need to return to. Our jobs, our classes, our responsibilities, our bills... But my prayer is that those who are being impacted by this revival are going back equipped to see and serve God throughout their vocations. So is this Asbury revival the beginning of some great Christian renewal in our culture? I think only time will tell because at this point the ball still seems to be rolling. But in all this, we should be praying for Asbury and praying for this revival and all those who are being impacted by their ministry that the word of God would work through this national event to call sinners of all stripes to repentance and everlasting peace offered to them in Jesus Christ. Yet we should continue to use discernment when it comes to Asbury or any other revival for that matter. Are they denying the means of grace given to us in baptism? That's a big one when it comes to altar calls. Are they calling Christians away from the objective means of grace in word and sacrament? And are they somehow downplaying the miraculous work of God in every aspect of our lives, not just the good times? These are questions we should continually ask ourselves as we hear more news about Asbury and as we encounter other revivals that may be similar to it. But it looks like that's going to be all the time I have for today. I want to thank you for tuning in. Uh, please feel free to leave comments or questions below. Until we come back with a new episode, may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ.